Hey everyone, thanks for joining me in session 160 of the Behavioral Observations Podcast. This episode is a fun Q&A with none other than Dr. Greg Hanley. It was a recorded Zoom call that, uh, that was done with the ABA study group and the Behavioral Observations Patreon members. This whole thing was the brainchild of Celia Heyman, and as you'll hear, she also supplied the, uh, the voiceover talent for the Behavioral Observations introduction. Um, and it was, uh, I guess, in celebration of the ABA study group reaching a huge milestone in membership. I think they had, at the time, uh, reached 40, 45,000 members, uh, which is just simply amazing. Uh, so, yes, so this was a fun call. We talked about a whole host of things, which I'll get to in a minute. But uh, I also want to uh, thank uh, Dr. Megan Miller. She was kind enough to lend us her industrial-sized capacity Zoom account, which came in handy, because I think we had almost uh, like five or 600 attendees to this call, uh, which is probably the largest Zoom call I've ever been a part of. Um, so thank you, Megan. Uh, if you'd like to keep up with what Megan's been up to, check out her website, which is located at uh, collective.dobettermovement.us. All right, back to the episode itself. We started the session with me asking Greg about an essay he published a few months ago titled A Perspective on Today's ABA, which you can find over at his website, practicalfunctionalassessment.com. I have it all linked in the show notes for this episode as well, uh, if you want to just go directly there. Uh, But we got into a lot of questions on this topic, including what inspired him to write the essay, what today's ABA actually means to him. I'm using quote air quotes that you can't see when I'm saying that today's ABA. Um, So we get into what he means by that. Uh, We we talk about how students and practitioners alike, uh, about the struggles with reconciling different messages on functional assessment that are prevalent right now in the field and how to navigate those things. Uh, We talk about, you know, kind of what's new in the practical functional assessment, skills-based treatment process, uh, how that process aligns with trauma-informed care, and much, much more. And uh, because it was a Zoom call, uh, we also took questions from the members of the audience. And uh, here I will offer an apology of sorts if the facilitation of these questions comes off, uh, I guess, a bit clunky. I was trying to read and at times edit and then convey these questions to Greg in real time, all you know, in the little chat window in Zoom. Uh, it's an art I have apparently not mastered yet, um, but that notwithstanding, I'm hoping you're able to still get a lot of insight out of that segment of the show because we did cover some interesting topics. So... Again, just huge thanks to Megan, huge thanks to Celia, and of course, uh, congrats to the uh, ABA study group for reaching that milestone, and more importantly, all the work that they do uh, turning students into practitioners. And of course, thanks to Greg for, I think, uh, coming on the show the fifth time, I think. So, uh, And while I'm handing out the thanks, I want to say thank you to the sponsors of this episode. Uh, I'll start off with the institutional patron tier, Green Space Behavioral Technology. They offer cutting-edge supervisor coaching, performance and competency-based trainings, and organizational supports for new BCBAs and trainees. Find out how you can optimize your supervision practices, improve clinical outcomes, and increase employee satisfaction over at greenspacebehavior.com. We're also brought to you by Behavior University. Their mission is to provide university-quality professional development for the busy behavior analyst. Learn about their CEU offerings, including their recently revised eight-hour supervision course, uh, and lots of uh, resources and courses for RBTs over at behavioruniversity.com forward slash observations. We're brought to you by HRIC Recruiting. Bar Boss has been placing BCBAs in positions throughout the U.S. for over a decade and has been recruiting for 30 years. So when you when you work with HRIC, you work directly with her, and you're working with someone who really knows what they're doing in this space. So to learn more, uh, contact Barb at hricolorado.com to schedule a confidential chat. And last but certainly not least, we're brought to you by the Stone Soup Conference, the 2021 Stone Soup Conference. It's taking place on October 22nd. It is a virtual event, and quite honestly, I challenge you to find a better value in any virtual event that's out there right now. Uh, it is uh, very reasonable in price, and it's got podcast favorites like 
doctors Luna LeBlanc, Ditu Rajaraman, Jim Moore, Kerry Milico, and uh, many, many more. There's a topic uh, for just about anyone who's uh, in, the, in the field of behavior analysis. So there's lots of interesting stuff there. And again, it's very, very reasonable. Um, and, and for it to be even more reasonable, use the promo code podcast to save at checkout. You can find the link to the Stone Soup Conference over at behavioralobservations.com, or you can go to lrcss.com forward slash stone soup. Or you can just Google Stone Soup Conference 2021. You'll find all the information there very, very quickly. So um, thanks to all the sponsors for making this podcast happen. And so without any further delay, let's get to this Q&A with Greg Hanley and the ABA Study Group. Welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast, stimulating talk for today's behavior analyst. Now here's your host, Matt Sicoria. All right, uh, Celia, thank you for doing that. Uh, I know you've been practicing. That's very sweet of you to to do that, and even more so. It's uh, I, I think uh, it's worth it's worthwhile giving Celia an extra extra special shout out uh, because she uh, not only arranged for all this, um, but she's as many of you know is just such an integral per, uh, part of the ABA study group. Uh, quite, quite literally responsible for hundreds, possibly thousands of people passing the exam. Uh, it's not hyperbole. I should just. Uh, and, and so the work you you you've done, Celia, is just incredibly noteworthy. And so I would uh, love it if everyone could just take a minute and give uh, give Celia a shout out here in the chat. Uh, I, a couple other things I like about Celia: she's always always thinking about behavior analysis. Uh, she's always learning new stuff. And, um, and it's just a great asset to the field. So, uh, Celia, have I, have, have I sufficiently embarrassed you uh, yet? I, uh, all right, good, good. That's, that's the intention here. No, all, all kidding aside. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's really remarkable. So, um, another shout out that is, uh, definitely, uh, worth, uh, worth noting here is uh, Dr. Megan Miller. Uh, we're using this zoom, this extra expanded capacity zoom platform that she's generously provided. For, for the low, low price of uh, a four-pack of uh, a Heady Topper, which is uh, at one point was a very hard-to-find uh, uh, New England IPA. So I will be uh, wrapping that up in a secure package and getting that to St. Petersburg as soon as, uh, as soon as I can. So let's get into it. Uh, Greg, how have you been? Good, Matt. Thanks. Good. I, uh, I, I, we've been uh, kind of chatting or texting, I suppose. Uh, and, and the other day, I, I, I think I sent you a text, something along the lines where I was uh, talking with a parent who was concerned about some of the things she's read about ABA uh, online. And um, as we all know, this is a discussion that's been happening a lot in the field, just more generally. And there's no shortage of people who, uh, have uh, uh, let's just say uncharitable things to say about the practice of behavior analysis online, uh, and and uh, she had she had found it. Um, and one of the things I talked to her about, I'm not going to get too much into the details of the conversation, but uh, I said, you know, uh, there there's there's a guy in our field, and he, he actually wrote this really thoughtful essay, and and I'd like to share it with you. And so I shared it with the parents and uh, it was uh, really well received by them. And so it just kind of got me thinking more and more about it. And um, so what I wanted to do, Greg, is just kind of ask you some questions, kind of dig into your uh, your essay, today's ABA, uh, in a little bit more detail. I thought that would be a fun uh, conversation to have, an enlightening one, uh, very likely. So with that in mind, uh, you know, I, we're certainly going to get into what you mean by today's ABA and so forth. But I'd like to start with um, with your thoughts on what 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 today's ABA what what is it not? Uh, you know, what philosophies, strategies, tactics, etc. Do you feel aren't part of today's ABA? In other words, what were the stimuli that you were reacting to when it dawned on you, like, hey, it might be a good idea to put these thoughts down on paper? Mm. Yeah. Um... Uh, Matt, again, thanks for the opportunity to even talk about this stuff, because uh, it's all about getting the right words out there. And there's so many words out there. And so uh, I appreciate the platform. And thank you, Meg and, and Celia, obviously, for all that you do uh, to make all this stuff happen as well. Uh, I guess when I reflect, I, I have to be clear, Matt, uh, I, I didn't write that. I didn't have a long 
building period when I wrote that. I wrote that in one day. Uh, Tony Camilleri was kind enough to edit it that afternoon, and I posted it then because he said, yeah, you should post it. And I said, yeah, I think I will. And it was as simple as that. But understand the history was such that I wanted to write something that uh, described our processes that we were supporting a lot of teams on without a lot of uh, behavior analytic uh, words. And uh, and I was also, like everyone else, um, most people in this country, upset by what was going on at the time with George Floyd and whatnot. And I couldn't help but see the similarities and seeing another man restrained and um, you know the outcome of that and thinking about what goes on in our field every day. Uh, that was really the impetus for that happening. It wasn't actually that thoughtful, uh, <laughs> you know, that planned. Uh, don't, maybe that's not the right word, but it wasn't terribly well planned. Uh, um, but I guess when I reflect on it, Matt, I look back on it and say, what isn't today's ABA? Um, I think the first thing I think about is today's ABA isn't a compliance first ABA. I, I'd say I, that's probably the most important thing to teach people, that it's not about compliance first, that it's not you meet the child, you inspire them with a candy to sit in a chair despite their negative emotional state and whatnot. And not that everybody does that and not that most people even do that nowadays, but it is to be understood maybe just firmly acknowledged that our mission when we first meet kids is not to get compliance. Instructional control is terribly important, but it comes at a cost when it's reluctant uh, instructional control, when it's meandering instructional control, when it's against what they really want to do, instructional control. And so um, uh, that was the, that's the main one I, I really think about when I reflect on it. Um, I think the other one is it's not just about outcomes. I was a, kind of a Machiavellian pragmatist early on in my career. I was like, well, he or she who affects the greatest behavior change wins. But I don't believe that's the case. I believe he or she who creates the best behavior change and the most beautiful process to do it. It's not just about the outcome. It's about uh, how you get there. And are you building or destroying relationships? And does it look great or does it look like hell? But yet you got there. And so I think that's a part of what today ABA is not. It's this kind of Machiavellian pragmatism is not today's ABA. Um, I think, uh, and then there's just kind of tactical things, Matt. I, I think for me, and I hope others, the idea of, you know, singular establishing operations, controlling repertoires of behavior that are maintained by singular reinforcers, that's not today's ABA. That's not understanding ecology or the power of interactions. Um, I think today's ABA isn't about closed economies. Today's ABA isn't about asking parents and children what they love, putting them in a box, hiding it in a closet till the therapist shows up and they get an hour up with the goodies. That's not today's ABA. Today's ABA is increasing general levels of reinforcement and knowing that kids can't satiate on synthesized reinforcement. <laughs> you can't satiate on everything. So uh, the beauty of that is you don't have to restrict it. Uh, that's part of today's ABA and maybe what's not. And then there's other stuff at the periphery. A lot of people think I'm against, as a person, uh, restraint and timeout and punishment and, uh, and extinction. And that's not the case. It's just that I think they shouldn't be the main drivers of behavior change. The main drivers of behavior change in today's ABA is uh, prompting and differential reinforcement. Uh, that's that's the driver of behavior change. And then there are times where there's emergency restraint and whatnot. I don't want it outlawed or regulated against. I just want us to do better and not rely on it. And once we've had to do it once, that's too much for us. We should be reflecting on our programming tomorrow and making sure that, you know, we're not doing those things. Um, same thing with extinction. It's not that today's ABA doesn't involve extinction. It's just we don't let it be the main driver of behavior change. Um, and uh, if we have to use extinction, if non-reinforcement is experienced more than a handful of times, that we reflect on how we're prompting and how we're shaping, and we change that. So today's ABA is highly responsive, and, and we try to get out of those dicey situations. And um, I'll give you one more, one more that uh, everything I come up with, I'm thinking of the next one, but I'll end on this one. Uh, today's ABA is not about working kids through negative emotional states. I think that's something I really like conveying to folks. That's the past. And we've done that. And, uh, and again, I just think going forward, when we see a child's upset, our job is to see that, teach them we understand something's upset them, and to change something right then and there, not to work them through it. 
it's just not that important to teach somebody their colors or whatever match the sample thing we're doing to push them through a negative emotional state that some kids will remember and be affected by, um, you know, for days to follow. So uh, there's more on that. I got to think more about it, but, but I appreciate the chance to reflect on and share that much. Yeah, sure. No, I think that's a, I think that's a great start to this, uh, to this conversation. You know, I have another kind of like, uh, I guess we considered a precursor type of question before we get into like the, 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 the heart of the, the essay here. Um, and, and, and in a way you already answered it partially and saying you sat down and just kind of sounded like you just busted it out in a day. But uh, obviously this essay is a different style of writing compared to what you might see in, in the latest issue of Java and things like that. Um, so can you, Talk about the writing process for this. I mean, you know, obviously you had some thoughts uh, on on your mind, but you, you know, it sounds like you you, you know you you did belt it out rather quickly. Um, it reads differently, obviously. It sounds like you started to you know use some. It you removed a lot of the jargon that we're you know so good at uh, populating our, our our documents with and things like that. So just from a process standpoint, I'd love to hear a little bit more about how this came about. Yeah. Um... Well, I'll tell you, Matt, you know, when you write for journals, you, you, whenever you write, you're writing with an audience in mind. I've taught that. I've been taught that. I taught that to others. You write with your audience in mind. You write as though you're speaking to them at that moment. You're making your keystrokes. And at that time, I didn't imagine my audience necessarily to be behavior analysts per se, uh, or at least not seasoned behavior analysts. I imagine my audience to be new behavior analysts, RBTs who wanted to be behavior analysts or simply we're happy with being an RBT, but perhaps new to the field. I was writing it maybe for parents, although it would seem a little strange. I think a lot of parents to read it and still be like, what is this guy talking about? Uh, so I think they need a professional connection. And I was writing it to other, for other professionals. I was imagining the SLP asking about ABA and I was imagining the OT and the teacher. And I was also writing it with uh, autism advocates in mind. You know, I read that stuff and I try to uh, listen as best as I can. And so I, I pretended they were in the audience as well when I was writing it. And then the other part is I just wrote from the heart. I just wrote how I felt in the moment. And I don't usually do that because when I'm writing for journals. I can't write from the heart. I have to like dial down. I have to shift down maybe four gears to get my tentative on uh, because I know how terribly important that is. And to make sure everything I says has a scholarship, you know, you know, background to it. But with this, I didn't care about scholarship. I didn't care about references. I didn't care about who said what before me. I, it wasn't part of the process. I just said what I was feeling at the moment. And I had an audience I was talking to. That was pretty much it. That's why it reads different, I guess. I see. I see. Uh, well, I, I think it certainly uh, hit the mark for sure. Um, so, so I want to talk a little bit about, uh, I want to start off with the concept of uh, expectations. You know, but in today's ABA, and you mentioned it several times in the uh, the 10-hour course that you guys uh, have on your uh, uh, website at uh, FTFBC. Um, so use the term high expectations. In my own work, uh, this is just some actually very recent cases, as a matter of fact. I, I've uh, come across some parents uh, and other caregivers too, that, that really, um, they really resist, uh, putting expectations on, on their children or on their learners, if they're, if they're teachers and, and will th- say things, well, their brains are different or this or that, um, there it's too stressful and, and things along those lines. And, and as such, uh, they're, they don't have any expectation of following through with what most we consider um, reasonable activities, uh, you know, things that uh, anyone who's going to lead a, a a life that is, uh, um, you know, we're, we're, um, I guess I, that's maybe productive, or I mean, we could probably you know think of a number of different adjectives, but um, I, I wonder um, what your thoughts are on, on this, um, you know, and, and more importantly, can you share some strategies of how you and your team respond to caregivers who have these, I guess I, the term I keep calling them is kind of limiting beliefs, you yeah. know, that they're, they're, they're ch- their child couldn't possibly eat anything other than mac and cheese, or they couldn't possibly, you know, uh, wear anything other than the the red sweatshirt or what have you. Right on. And, right so. on. I, I'll be honest, Matt. I don't, 
I don't have a lot of tactics to change that. I, I'll be frank. I really don't. I, I think I think the deal is, is in our all our processes, no matter what the behavior change target is, whether it's sleep or eating or, you know, uh, problem behavior and whatnot, uh, we're always asking questions about, well, what are your goals? And it might be to the client if we're talking a, a student in public school with an EBD label or something of the sort, but usually it's parents, teachers, caregivers. And we're saying, well, what are your goals <laughs> when they're aggressive and or self injurious in this situation? What do you think they should be doing? And we call that obviously contextually appropriate behavior. And so even though I have raging ideas about what people should do, we all do. That's to be human. Uh, I generally I'm pretty good about not sharing them. Uh, I simply ask the questions about what do you think they should be doing in this context? And, and then we generally find common ground. It's not that I'm completely distant from the process. I'll give my two cents of one. I love recommending, well, I know you want them to do X and Y at the table, but I think it'll be really cool to work on imitation because that's such a foundational skill. And I think that, you know, everything else will take off if we can get that off the ground. So I will, I find myself, if anything, that backing away from higher expectations to build some of those core skills up, some of those early readiness skills that we're all aware of. But in general, I don't find that what you're talking about too much uh, because uh, there's usually something a parent would like the child to do better. Thank goodness. They may not mm -hmm. want X, Y, or Z to be better, and I might, but there's other things that, that are on their agenda, and, and we just work with that. And then the other thing is when kids go through especially uh, functional assessment and skill-based treatment, you know how it branches. Once parents learn that the child can learn, you know, the objective set forth, I think they get a little excited and say, okay, what about this? And so when we say hold the child to high expectations at the table, those expectations are largely set by the people we're talking to, our collaborators, which are our parents and teachers. And, you know, I got related on to that today's ABA article, the biggest, you know, negative feedback I got was generally from autism advocates and, you know, they have all sorts of expressions nowadays, uh, you know, ableist and virtue signaling and all those kind of things. I was called out on those things multiple times. And and I, I will say that I am an ableist in the sense that I do believe that all kids with severe problem behavior need to learn to communicate better, tolerate better and cooperate better. I believe those core skills are important for all learners. And I'm, and I'm kind of not backing down on that one. Now, mm -hmm. beyond the core skills where everything branches I have no, I have no uh, say in that, and that's where I don't think I'm ableist. Where I really let the listeners, uh, you know, whoever the uh, collaborators are, really dictate where we're going from there. I don't get involved. In fact, I pride myself on the fact that our company links up with people that do precision teaching, then other people doing the Kabbas program, then other people doing verbal behavior, and other people doing they you know they're all sorts of different forms of ABA, or some people are doing. SLP work during the branches, some people doing OT work. I love that. That's my point. Um, we're not dictating that. That's whoever we're consulting with is figuring that out. But I will say, before we get there, I am ableist in, a, in the sense that I think we need to know how to get kids happy, relaxed, and engaged. I didn't ask anyone, hey, do you want to be happy, relaxed, and engaged? I'm just assuming that we should know that. We should try to figure that out. I'm also not saying, hey, do you want to communicate better? Because a lot of people can't tell me that. I'm just assuming that using a picture card or saying words is better than punching somebody or punching themselves. So there's just some basic assumptions uh, that are important to the process. And then from there, it's value free as far as the professional is concerned. Okay. Very good. Um, so I want to return to another section of the essay. Um, one section in particular uh, discusses that uh, it, I believe it says, uh, quote, uh, our field has been associated with wrongs in our journey of helping people. Um, so this uh, statement, I think, in many, uh, uh, with probably with a lot of behavior analysts, might generate a little bit of defensiveness. Uh, I think that-, that Man, I thought these were going to be softball questions. This is this like is, hardcore press. This is, right? this is, press. <laughs> my, this is like Mike I'm Wallace. Ready, my man. <laughs> I, I, I'm, only, this, I'm this asking him because I, I, I know you can handle it. Um, <laughs> hey there, I want to talk to you real quick about the Stone Soup Conference that's coming up on October 22nd, 2021. This will be a virtual event, and it will be available after the actual live event as well. Uh, it's got a lot of uh, behavioral observations alumni 
Uh, and I'm just looking at the speakers list right now. We've got uh, Linda LeBlanc, uh, Ditu Rajaraman, Jim Moore, Matt Broadhead, Carrie Milico, Kelsey Rupel, and Jordan Belil. Uh, so there's a, a, a lot of different perspectives that are represented here uh, in terms of uh, you know, topics, etc. Uh, it just looks like an amazing event. It is incredibly reasonable. Uh, and as I said at the outset of the podcast, I challenge you to find a more reasonable uh, virtual event. Um, it's made even more reasonable if you use the uh, offer code podcast, and that's in all caps, uh, to uh, check it out. So um, you can go to the show notes for this episode over at behavioralobservations.com, or you can go to lrcss.com and look for the Stone Soup 21 conference there. I hope you get a chance to check it out. Okay, let's get back to this Q&A with Greg. You know, so I, uh, I, I'm wondering what your thoughts on this are in general. Um, you know, uh, and and in particular, whether BCBA should apologize for practices, studies, and things like that that didn't participate in. You know, sure. uh, um, you, you know, because uh, you know, on the one hand, it might make sense. You know, like referencing back to that family I talked about earlier. You know, they have the reservations about ABA. You know, and uh, you know, I don't know if the words themselves "I'm sorry" would would have made a difference or not, but. At the same time, you know, but it, it so it might. I guess where I'm what I'm going where I'm going with this is that it might maybe build some rapport on the one hand, but on the other hand, you know, uh, it. Um, I don't know. It's kind. Of, you know, it's kind of like uh, apologizing for something I didn't do. You know, <laughs> and, and 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 so I'm wondering. Um, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. And another thing, I I think I'd probably just throw in the mix for you to consider here too is that you know one of the things I, you know. It, th- is uh, you know noticing the evolution in our field uh, of practice and practice standards and things like that, and so this part of me thinks like uh, having to take responsibility for you know things that have happened years and years ago is uh, you know might be like a like a dentist apologizing for once using an amalgam filling where you know composite fillings are now you know closer to the standard of care. Um, it's a good so- analogy. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think one of the things is our our field is, is uh, the life cycle is that of like a like you know, whereas the life cycle of medicine is is centuries. You know, behavior analysis we're seeing it evolve in real time, so we can see the curvature of the earth, if you will. <laughs> whereas you know, medicine might be more of a flat line. So anyway, well, I don't know I, if there's a question in there. There's probably not. Oh, there, but, there is. <laughs> I mean, I have I have some responses at strength, so I think it's a good point. It's a good point. Listen, I want to be clear with that piece too. I don't write things to piss people off. Some people think I do. I try to be provocative. I don't try to be provocative. I'm just honest, and the honesty actually comes from my own reflection on my own experiences. And I and anyone who knows me, anyone who's a student of mine, knows that I believe a lot in reflection. When you do something, you think about it afterwards. When you teach a class on Tuesday at nine. Tuesday at 10, don't schedule another class. Go to your office and think about what you did. Write your notes, put in the folder. So when you do it next time, it's better. So reflective practice is very important to me. And and for me, I spent a lot of time before writing that and and doing this stuff. I, I, for about five years, I did these talks called the the 10 mistakes of ABA. And I remember a, a mentor of mine came up saying, that is the most obnoxious title I have ever seen. And he didn't, see the talk. Of course, he didn't go to the talk. You know, I don't know what he was doing, but he wasn't at my talk, but he found it okay to, you know, neg the title a little bit there, negate it. And I said, uh, actually, I'm talking about my own mistakes, not Mm. others' mistakes. And if you came to the talk, you'd realize it wasn't as noxious as you uh, made out to be. But the the point being, it's the same thing with this apology stuff uh, or, or saying we've done some wrong in the past. It was personal to me. I believe we have done some wrongs. And by we, I mean me. And we, I do mean we, because I've been around, I've never worked myself as a behavior analyst. I was right. always a part of a larger organization and uh, maybe inspired students to do things that were wrongheaded by today's standards. Now, whether to apologize that, I think that's a good point. I, I've always said in the past, uh, heart surgeons never apologize for all the people they killed when heart surgery wasn't as good as it is now. Why do we have to apologize? And I, I think part of it, Matt, you know, what it really comes down to for me is, you know, when you're going into heart surgery, you sign on the dotted line and you consent to all those risks. But a lot of the people we serve, they're really not the consenting person, Mm -hmm. are they? Someone else is consenting for the therapy for them. And then we are doing some things that in hindsight are questionable. 
That's why I apologize. It, it, and a lot of it to me is about consent and the lack of assent that was available in some of our practices in the past. But I think we're fixing that now. Thank goodness. Um, but again, it, it, it's about changing behavior and forgetting about the relationship between you and that person. And uh, I think if we champion that going forward, we won't have any concerns. If we make sure the process is beautiful, people can withdraw assent. And we know that the relationship is as important as any target behavior change. I don't think we'll be apologizing. And I think our pr- technology will just get better like it does, as you said, in medicine. I see. And, and I don't think other people need to go around and apologize. I'm not saying that. You know, yeah. I mean, yeah. A it's too, too much drama there. I think we just need to acknowledge there are things because it's all about controlling behavior. We have to be very careful. We have to be careful. And this isn't new ideas. Skinner said this years ago. We just got to listen, you know, to some of those writings. We have to be very careful. Just because you can change behavior doesn't mean you should. Just because you can change it that way doesn't mean you should do it that way because your advisor taught you to do it that way and you're not comfortable with the other yet. So those are my responses. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Very uh, uh, make, makes a lot of sense from where I stand. So thanks for elaborating on that. Um, and I like the piece about reflective practice too. You know, I mean, I certainly think about some of the, there's a lot of behavior plans I would like to have back and uh, <laughs> to do over that I, you know, may have written many, many years ago. So I, uh, I can totally, totally see that for sure. Um, all right. Um, so yeah, another softball here. Uh, what, 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 what practices that are currently being taught and used in the field that you would encourage BCBAs to reconsider in their reflection, I guess, or, uh, yeah, or let me, or let me ask a question a little bit differently here. Maybe, maybe you can get at the answer, uh, from a different angle. Like, you know, I, I and I, I think we've talked about this in, in some of our previous, uh, interviews too, but, uh, how, Greg, how how would you advise students who are attempting to assimilate varying perspectives on functional assessment, um, you know, and skills based treatment, and things like that, um, as well as teachers who are charged with covering specific content uh, with the idea of preparing people for the exam? Uh, there are, I think, admittedly, some mixed messages, perhaps that uh, that that uh, both students and and practitioners alike are, are getting. So. Can you, can you talk a little bit about how to navigate some of this stuff, sure. at least from your perspective? It's hard. I'll talk about it. It's hard, though. Let's just acknowledge it's hard. And to celebrate the fact that we are not in a boring field right now, that it's <laughs> dynamic. It's dynamic. And you're going to have to sweat a little bit to figure out who you're going to be in this field. you got to work. You can't just listen to the lecture and say, I'll go that route. And so that we have to acknowledge all that. Uh, but at the same time, I don't think we need to be quiet to be more soothing to those uh, listening. You know what I mean? I think we have to just put the right information out there and, and uh, time will do its job. Right. Uh, but uh, let me say something better about it. We want to talk about how do you teach functional assessment? People ask me, how do you, you know, what should we do with teaching functional assessment? I, I have a really strong opinion on this and I'm sure it's shared by extremely few people, but I taught, you know, those kind of classes for years uh, I think you teach your course from a historical perspective and a practical perspective. And I put a whole bunch of stuff in my historical section. And I love celebrating the history. I'm a functional assessment geek. I mean, I've grown up on this stuff. And so I don't think there's a functional assessment article I've never, I haven't read. And so uh, I will teach the historical perspective. I'll go back to Skinner and Lovas and early, you know, Wayne Saylor research and Ted Carr's work and Brian Awada's work, work. And we'll talk about it from a historical perspective and how we grew. I also love teaching from the historical perspective because then you realize a lot of the things that are practically implementable today, we're sitting and parked in the literature forever. It's all there. It just, for whatever reasons, some political, it's been, you know, suppressed and not as popular as other things. Um, and so, uh, again, when you teach functional assessment, I'll teach all those other things, the standard analysis, how to do a, you know, descriptive assessment, ABC recording using the Bijou symbols from 1968. I'll go through all that historically, but then I'll say, okay, tomorrow you have a kid in the classroom with severe behavior. How do you proceed and how can you defend that process? That's a very different part of the class. You know what I mean? So Mm -hmm. I teach both, but I, by frame it. 
And I said, just because it's out there doesn't mean you should do it. You have to be able to defend your practice to the parents and to constituents and to yourself. And that's where I get into the practical functional assessment stuff, which I think is more defensible than the historical alternatives. So there's historical and there's practical. And I don't think there's any schism there when you frame it uh, that way. Um, as far as the stuff, you know, maybe that's to be put in the historical column, again, you know, for some people, this is rash. To me, these are thoughts I've had for years. And I, it, to me, it's not new. And it, it, it would be brash if I thought them and said them the first time. But if I've been writing about them for a decade, I feel like it's not brash anymore. I feel like you know, <laughs> it's, it's okay. So uh, I don't think we should do stimulus avoidance assessments. I'll throw that out there. Fixed time delivery of a possible punishing event to measure the extent to which a child escapes or engages in negative emotional behavior to infer that something may or may not be punishing for another response, that should be in our rear view. If you're doing that right now, that's a mistake. That's an example of things we need to cut out, but it's still happening. I see posters out of the conferences. It's frustrating. I'll give you another one that's even more maybe controversial to me, to others, not to me. I don't think we should use isolated contingencies. I don't think we should ever be so bold to think that that complex repertoire, that complex class of multiple topographies responding is occasioned by a single event and reinforced by a single event. To me, it's bordering on absurdity at this point, but man, it's, it's anchored. It's anchored by our journals and our conferences, but that's, that should be historical to me. Escape extinction as the main driver of behavior change, breaking kids like horses, I don't know. I, I don't see it as controversial. It's not that we don't use extinction every now and then. We use extinction, uh, but we use it in a very careful way. We make sure it's not the main driver of behavior change, and we make sure that the process is as devoid of negative emotion as possible, as all good therapy is. Um, let's see. Well, I guess I would leave it there. Well, one more thing. I think in general, just non-responsiveness to our clients that's historical to me, that every time a child behaves towards us, we should respond to it. Forget about contingencies and reinforcement for a minute. Just know that when you have a little person or a big person and they're responding towards you and you give no response, there may be nothing more aversive for that learner than that. That context in which we are non-responsive to them are more aversive than context involving punishers. We have studies showing that. We need more research on it, obviously. But I'll tell you, I'll give you an example, Matt, of something today that I would never have done five, 10 years ago. Every time a child has any complaint, negative emotional response, we say something, we acknowledge it, and we're empathetic when we do it. And we can do that because we use synthesized reinforcers by, by giving them a little bit of attention, but still encouraging them to persist at that hard task. We still have reinforcers we can use differentially. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, you can yeah. give a little love. Say, I, I get you, man. This is hard. I understand why you're complaining. This is tough stuff. But I think you can handle it. You do a little more, could you? I'm withholding escape, tangibles, control, man compliance. I gave him a little bit of attention. And I can do that because I, I'm using basically partial extinction. I can't do that when I'm using isolated reinforcement. Again, another reason to walk away. All right. So there's right. more to it. But uh, I'll leave it at those things. And for some people, they're no brainers. For other people, they might be aghast. I don't know. I, I can't. For me, it's just fact at this point. It's how we live our life as practitioners in my world. You probably already know that Behavior University creates engaging ABA content for new and experienced professionals. Whether it's RBT training or webinars for BACD CEUs, Behavior University has you covered. New for fall 2020? Behavior University is launching an interactive BACB supervisor training, an innovative approach to supervision training with interactive video to practice decision making and tools to create a personalized portfolio to take with you when you're done. The course is designed to guide new supervisors through applying the important skills required for effective supervision to their own unique experiences. Behavior University also offers two tiers of RBT training. Choose the essentials for the 40-hour course or the premium to add a full kit of study materials and, full, and a full-length practice exam. In addition to these features, supervisors can now purchase access to these RBT courses so they can monitor any RBT training for course progress and quiz performance. 
supervisors will also receive tools and content to support training of new staff. Users rave about Behavior University RBT training, calling it the clearest instruction, the course that made it stick, amongst other comments. BCBA say that their staff clearly get it after taking their course. Behavior University is the brainchild of doctors Jessica Love and Shannon Crozier, two BCBA Ds with a passion for applied behavior analysis and evidence-based practices. So to check out what they've built and to get podcast-specific discounts, head on over to behavioruniversity.com forward slash observations. Okay, well, we'll get to the gas piece in, in a minute, I think. Uh, but uh, I uh, and I want to get more into the PFA SBT stuff, uh, uh, more direct, you know, more talk about some more tactically relevant stuff here. But before we get to that, uh, just to kind of wrap up the today's ABA piece, and we, that's not to say we can't come back to it, but uh, I, I'd be curious to to hear what sort of feedback you've received on the on the piece, both. Uh, from practitioners or other stakeholders, uh, maybe other people in you know in the uh, in the Java world, or you know this. Or I'm using that as just a, a a metaphor for the you know the Behavior Analytic Academy, if you will. Um, can you talk about some of the responses you've gotten to that? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Uh, I've had some of the most lovely communications. I'm getting a little feedback, Matt. Are you? Should I change my microphone or something? I'm hearing you, you okay? fine. Yeah, I don't. I'm not. I'm not okay. picking up. I don't know if anyone else is or not. Um, no, let's just okay. go. Let's just roll with it until someone says uh, otherwise. Everyone okay. in the chat says it sounds Very fine. Good. So I don't. Even, I don't even think I'm going to edit this out. So let's just All right, keep going. Lovely. <laughs> okay, <laughs> this is real. This is live, people. <laughs> this is real. This is this um, is actually happening. This is real too. What was the question again, Matt? No. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, oh, uh, so the feedback. I've gotten some yeah. of those most lovely feedback from this article. Uh, this it's not even an article. It's an essay, as you called it, uh, from this perspective piece. I've had some of the most heartwarming feedback I've ever had in my career, and uh, I really felt great to receive some of these notes. And I, I was. I was just really happy to hear that and, and to communicate with some people I haven't communicated with in a bit because of that piece. Uh, at the same time, uh, those the people who responded like that are generally uh, practitioners, administrators of programs. Uh, they're in the thick of it, uh, of real behavior change. As you said, you talk about the Java world. Yeah, I'm, I still got one foot in that world, or maybe a toe or two. And uh, I didn't hear much from the Java world. I think it was painful, perhaps, for researchers or people who pride themselves on being scientists first to read such a such a soft piece from supposedly one of their own, perhaps. I don't know, but I didn't get a lot of feedback from uh, uh, the Java world. I, I can imagine what it would be, but they were kind enough to not send it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and the negative uh, feedback... I received was primarily from, again, autism advocates who thought it was just ableist, virtue signaling garbage from another evil ABA person, and we should all just, you know, quit ABA because it's the worst. And, you know, I take that. It's not that I didn't learn from that feedback. I do. I mean, it's like if I teach a course of 100 undergraduates research methods that I did in the past, and I get 99 saying, wow, I thought this was going to be so boring, but we had so much fun despite it being 8 a.m. in research methods. I had 99, and I had one person say, I hated this class, and, uh, you know, your fly was down on March 3rd, uh, you know, that kind of feedback. I'm only thinking about that cat's feedback oh, for a man. week. You'd see what I'm saying. I know exactly what you're saying because I can go into my so. iTunes reviews and uh, have the very same. Ex <laughs> I can quote the uh, the one star reviews. I think, sadly, right. Uh, but uh, right. hey, so hey, those we, negative ones. Hey, yeah. Hang on, I'm real just quick. Saying I heard them. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. This is I don't want this to disappear in the chat, but uh, just Felipe said uh, translating this article is one of the most important activities of my career. M many mothers who read it were moved. So I just want to share that with you before it scrolled up and out of view. So Felipe is a good man, and we've linked up recently. He is a scholar and a gentleman, uh, and uh, I appreciate that, Felipe. You're doing amazing things. You're a great citizen. So unfortunately, Greg, I cut you off to get that piece of feedback in before I uh, no, was not okay. able to read it. Yeah, 
It's okay. I was just saying the most negative feedback I got with some advocates, and it's not that they didn't have some content to what they were saying, but also I'm not a big fan of just being, you know, the names and gaslighting, ableist, you know, I'm like, like they read Facebook and just put some of those words in there. I'm like, if you're going to say that, tell me what you're actually talking about. Tact, the phrase, tell me exactly. What, <laughs> you can't just call me names like that. Right. But uh, but there were people that were a little more thoughtful with the feedback, thank goodness. And and I see where they're coming from. But I, I wish I could say, you know what? I read that feedback and I'm going to change our t- technology. You know, we're going to try this comparison. And I can't say uh, I, I had those epiphanies. What I did have is a, is a, a better sensitivity to how hurt people are uh, mm. who have autism when they just hear ABA, they're just, there's a lot of people in a lot of pain. And uh, I don't think my words are going to give much solace to, to be frank. I see. Yeah. All right. Very good. All right. So let's get into some, uh, uh, some, some real uh, technical stuff here regarding to the uh, skills-based treatment and things like that. Um, uh, we already talked about some of the pushback. Uh, I was going to ask you about that in terms of how your research group is getting responses from that. But I'll, I, I think what I'd rather do is kind of, Talk more about you know we're talking mainly to practitioners here, so let's let's focus on that I suppose. Yeah. Um, and, and one of the things that I, I uh, picked up from on on the, again the uh, the what do you guys call the big course the ten hour course that I referenced earlier uh, is that a lot of times your practice is way out in front of the the research cycle the publishing cycle yeah. uh, and that you guys are learning new things uh, all the time. Uh, and one of the things I think that uh, you and, and, and the, uh, the group does really nicely too, is you always talk about how the, how the, the clients teach, the clients are doing the teaching and you guys are doing the learning from them. Uh, and I always think, think that's a really important perspective to, uh, to, to look at this from. So what, what are you guys learning lately uh, from, from your work, you know, are there any, any kind of, uh, aha revelations or, Oh, you know, we do it like this. Now we used to do it like that, you you know, as it relates to the, uh, to the skills-based treatment process or, or the assessment process, the analysis. Yeah. I love that question, Matt. And I I wish our research, I wish we could be better. Uh, I feel bad for my team sometimes that I can't facilitate and allocate as much time as I would like to, to make it shorter from idea to project, to completion, to publication, but man, it takes us a long time. And I, I have to admit, it's probably going to be longer in the future, um, which is hard because I, I feel like I'm getting more reinforcers elsewhere. And I'm afraid I might not be a researcher uh, <laughs> or a scholar for too much longer. So I hope the contingencies change once COVID breaks, you know, changes and we get to, you know, go places. I think maybe those repertoires will recover, but uh, I'll tell you a couple of things real quick. Number one, we learned so much about response classes. I used to be kind of tentative about, yeah, well, if people report those problem behaviors co-occur, they're probably members of the response class. And man, they just are members of the response class. I mean, time and time again, we're just seeing that when kids have 19 topographies of severe behavior, they're generally operating on the environment and influenced by contextual factors similarly. And so that's a powerful understanding because it means we don't need 19 behavior programs for 19 problem behaviors. We need one that addresses the 19 because they're functionally equivalent. It's a very powerful understanding and it's just been affirmed more and more as we do our work. But uh, recent articles by Christy Warner, uh, one in Java and one uh, being reviewed, uh, really make that point clear if you want to learn more about that. I think the second one has got high cheese factor and I love it. It's one of my favorite things and it's called HR. E, it's happy, relaxed, and engaged. And uh, I have no, we have no studies out there. People are like, can you show me the research on that? And I'm like, oh, I can show you things all hovering around it, but I really can't. But here's what I mean by HRE. It is so important that we do not put an EO in, in the analysis or in the skill-based treatment process and until a child shows some indicators that they're happy, relaxed, and engaged, or it's variants, calm, relaxed, and engaged, happy, jacked, and you know, excited and engaged, whatever. Because when you put the EOs there, the disappointing cues that, you know, the things are going to change for a little bit and they're going to have to shift gears and do something a little more challenging. When you do it from HRE, you just don't get severe behavior by and large. And when you do it arbitrarily based on time or 
when the child is already escalated and then you're like, Hey, you got to do it anyway. So I got, you know, those <laughs> kind of things that you're it, the risk there is just so great. And so this whole concept of HRE is just so important to us because it, it allows us to bring the reality back. You know what I mean? It's not just, it's not just taking away the antecedents and saying, good luck, kid, we're going to lower the expectations for the rest of your life. It's, Let's get you happy, relaxed, and engaged. Then we're going to reintroduce reality because I know you can handle the smidge of it right now. And then we'll empower you by teaching you some, some effective responses. And so this HRE concept is really important. And I just love that practitioners now are bringing the joy. That's the first step in their process. They go into homes and they bring the joy every day. This is not something you just do in the ISCA. It's every day. You bring the joy. And until you brought the joy, don't try to teach joy first. I love that. Is that in an article? No. Will it ever right. be in an article? You know what I mean? This is hard to do research on, I hope. But uh, that's an important one to us. This notion of empowerment. I know a lot of behavior analysts bark at the word. Well, what a cheese ball. Look at him. Look at him selling, selling our science or whatever. I'm and really not selling it, our science. It is empowerment. Yeah. It, it, empowerment's powerful. Let's just make it clear. You put a kid in that context, you get them HRV, then you wildly disappoint them. And, and whatever protest response they have to the disappointment, you see it, honor it by putting them back in reinforcement. You taught them that their behavior is powerful, that they operate effectively in that context. This notion of empowerment is so much more important than knowing the function of behavior. So to me, that's not you know, written properly in any research article, but this notion of empowerment has therapeutic value well beyond, you know, what I used to, you know, the, I used to do contingency manipulation to understand the function. And I'm saying, I'm not doing that anymore. I'm literally doing the contingent manipulation to empower the child. I want them to learn. You don't need to escalate here. <laughs> Please don't ever escalate here. Do you know what I mean? So that's not in the research articles, but that's terribly important to us uh, right now. Uh, Let's see. Uh, this I mentioned earlier, but the the power of just acknowledging and empathizing with responses, ignoring nothing, being hyper responsive to people. You can still do it. You can be normal, and you can be good, and you can still be a good contingency manager. That's empower. That's important to me. That's not in any research article, but that's that's pretty important. Uh, let's see. I guess the last one is just different ways of extending this concept of keeping hope alive for learners, always being responsible and always figuring out a way to get surprise shorties in there, always putting new branches in. So when they go to the table of high expectations and they think they're going to do academics again, it's like, no, we're going for a scooter ride. You know what I mean? They're just like this constant keeping hope alive and surprising kids and teaching them that, that trust me, life's good with me. You know what I mean? I think that, that's probably the, the other fun stuff, the back end of HRE that I'm really enjoying lately. You know, it's funny. I was on the phone today with a special educator who's uh, working with a, uh, with a learner in this process. And she was telling me that uh, the, uh, the tolerance response and then the, uh, you know, the kind of like first phase of, of cooperation uh, was kind of breaking down a little bit. And, you know, the, the two questions I asked her is like, well, how frequently are you, progressing the EO, uh, you know, in, in other words, I was getting at that. I, I think I might've actually used the happy, relax and engage. And I said, you know, so let, let them, let them stay in reinforcement longer. And then what I also learned by asking a few more questions, uh, there were, there weren't as <laughs> the, uh, she wasn't adhering to the surprise shorties. And maybe if you could just take a second and explain what a surprise shorty is for sure. folks who are, are, you know, who, who didn't catch that part of your, you your webinar. My- yeah, the, I have maybe seven, maybe not the oh Urban Dictionary God. version of it, but the, yeah. yeah, no, I have like seven more uh, disgusting ways to think about it. So I'm going to keep <laughs> all myself and just be professionally safe. Some, here. some people listen to this podcast with their kids, so right, right on. Hi, uh, <laughs> la 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 la. <laughs> That's right. Anyways, the earmuffs, kids. Earmuffs, yeah. No, no. Uh, a surprise shorty is just uh, when you make it really clear the expectation is going to be high. There's going to be a lot of things to be done that you don't love. So you give a clear S delta, a signal of some impending non-reinforcement. However, once they begin begin in that response chain, maybe five responses in out of the hundred to be foreshadowed, you say, I love the way you started. I love the way you got down to business. Let's go back to your way or let's do something you want to do. That's, that's a surprise shorty. 
and it just has great power. Uh, remember, kids who start finish. Kids who don't aren't good at starting will never finish. And so, mm. surprise shorty is a really, really important part of what we do. And we love. I love schedules of reinforcement, but again, the schedule of intermittent, unpredictable reinforcement, the different lengths of behavior is to me where the magic is. And, and it's hard to talk about that. Everyone's like, well, it's a VR schedule. It's, it's not a VR schedule. It's multiple responses. It's different. And uh, well, once you get your head around it, once you really understand how to finesse intermittent, unpredictable reinforcement for various lengths of behavior, you can really do some teaching. You know? Great. Great. Um, all right. So uh, we mentioned Felipe earlier. Uh, let's see. I'd like to, I'd like to start getting some questions that I've received uh, and uh, in, in, a, in a few minutes, we'll take some questions in the chat too. But I would ask you, again, just ask you to hold them so we can read them. And because if you start firing them in the chat right now, they're going to scroll and they'll, they'll be they'll be in the they'll be in the uh, the Zoom chat oblivion. So, uh, so Felipe asks, uh, I have a case of a patient with in which the EO is communicating with the brother in the training environment. When the sibling is present in the training environment and communicates with that child, aggressive behaviors occur. Uh, however, I have doubts about the safety of his brother. I guess uh, the question, more generally, I suppose, uh, is that you know how do you how do you work with a situation like that uh, when the problem behavior occurs in the context of of in this case siblings, but you know we see the same thing in schools with peers uh, and whatnot. Um, yeah. So h- how how would you emulate the training environment so as to manage risk? Yeah, this is something uh, to be frank, we're not good at uh, yet. And we struggle with this just like you do, Felipe. And I say, and I'll tell you too, uh, you know, this, these last two years, I've had uh, maybe three cases that really did not get anywhere with me. And I was the consultant, three really complete failures. And uh, one of them had to do with, uh, you know, siblings, triplets, actually. And uh, it was very hard with the resources. And I never say, I never let anyone complain about resources, but here I go. It was in the home with the mom implementing with uh, three, you know, boys with autism and um, proved to be quite challenging. Uh, not that we're done, uh, but a pretty flame, flaming failure, <laughs> failure with that one. So uh, it's a little raw for me, Felipe. So it's hard for me to think clearly because I'm just thinking about those boys. But uh, I will tell you this. When I hear those stories, I always look for more stories where one of the children or the target child has some troublesome behavior in the absence of the peer. And I simply use that less motivated context to teach the skills. So what we've learned uh, from a real nice unpublished, uh, as of yet, a study by Ditsu, uh, Dithyan Rajaraman was that, you know, you can teach the skills under a variety of of uh, synthesized EOs, and those skills will transition to other evocative conditions, usually without any training. If it's going to require some training, it's probably because that other evocative context is a little more challenging, perhaps, than the one in which you taught the skills. So you got to be careful and not just train and hope under those conditions like you're describing. But again, the tactic is this, Felipe, do the interview and try to figure out more conditions under which the child has anything, even just a little mild protest behavior, and just try to teach the skills there first. And I would only introduce the brother when the target child has communication, toleration, and cooperation in the repertoire. Once they have the core skills, then you're basically doing generality work with the other brother. Um, There may be other paths, Felipe, but that's my first uh, thought. You know, uh, maybe sometime down the road, I think it'd be fun to have a conversation about these very challenging cases and maybe the some sort of problem solving process. So let's uh, let's put that on the back burner for some other time because I would love to, I I I want to know more about these cases. But we have got other questions to attend to for the time being. So, uh, and one of them is this. Uh, this is uh, Sherilyn from Illinois, and I think uh, you guys had some conversation at the uh, Illinois ABBA recently. And uh, so her question is as such. Uh, uh, hi, Dr. Hanley. In a school setting, I've run into a few times where we're not able to turn off the behavior. Um, I personally hypothesize this because there are some variables we can't eliminate or add. For example, going home, uh, having parents come, 
uh, removing non-preferred peers and staff. In those instances, would you still recommend the use of the PFA SBT? And if so, how would you respond to challenging behaviors that would still occur? Uh, yeah. I had a I had a, a, a case like this once where the kid would man for the bus at like 10 a.m. <laughs> you know, it's like it, it's not coming anytime soon. You know, so it's like we couldn't yeah. make the bus happen. You know, like get you know, can't do FCT. You know. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I have to admit to the question asker that I'm a one trick pony when it comes to this stuff. So my answer is always yes, we do PFA SBT. The reason is it's just PFA SBT is just a general set of guidelines, but there's a lot of flexibility within the process. It just means let's try to bring the joy first. It sounds like you check that box. It sounds like and then it, we want to progress an EO gently, uh, but saliently. Uh, third, we want to empower, we want a differential reinforcement. Fourth, we want that differential reinforcement to result in the behavior turning off. And it sounds like that's the fourth step that you're stuck on. But again, I would still do the process. I would just make some changes. So one change is like we talked about earlier, I want to make sure that the EOs are being presented during HRE. So if the, again, the presenting problem is can't turn off the problem behavior. I want to make something very clear. When we fail with this process, sometimes because we can't get HRE. We just can't get it for some kids. You got a 35 year old man who's been on all sorts of medications and, and their behavior is so unlawful. And, and, you know, there's a whole bunch of things go. Sometimes we just can't get it. We don't trust it. We think we have it and we're not. They're just, they're making masks. They're not really, the affect isn't correlated, et cetera. Okay. But the point being, we don't fail with turning off problem behavior. I can't, we, we did in the past three or four years ago, cause we didn't do what we do now. So I, I just can't even remember a time recently that we don't turn off problem behavior. So I'm going to go through a couple of fixes for you. Uh, and maybe these will help. I don't know. Number one, make sure you get HRE, spend more time in HRE. If you're spending 30 seconds, spend three minutes. If you're spending five minutes, spend 50 minutes just hang out and to, you know, follow the child's lead more. That's number one. Okay. Just multiply it out. Second, when you progress the EO slow, I when I watch videos in clinical meetings, I've never, I rarely see a video. I'm like, ah, that was slow enough. <laughs> it's always the claps too loud. The movement's too quick. The RBT is like a hawk. Like, oh, and they just <laughs> snatch the iPad. I'm like, no, too fast. <laughs> they didn't see it coming. They should see it coming. The progressing the O should be conversational. You do something, you wait for their response, you don't get it. You do something, you wait for their response, you don't get it. You know what I mean? That little back and forth. So maybe slow down your role with the EO. Then, is, then the third thing is, are you sure there's, they're not protesting or showing you any indicators that they're going to escalate? So sometimes problem behavior is hard to turn off because we're not reinforcing the precursors. We're waiting until it gets close to that emotional borderland, as we've talked about. So I'd want you to make sure you watch the videos. It's hard to do live. It's no mistakes. There's, there's no big sin here. This is hard to do. But watch the videos. You might see some earlier indicator responses. Then the fourth thing is, was your reinforcement salient enough? Enough. A lot of kids, they don't even realize we reinforced. You know what I mean? They don't even know that there was a change in the prevailing conditions. They're still under threat. Uh and so make sure it's salient. Again, look at that video. Make sure it's painfully obvious to the learner. And then the last thing is, are we providing all the reinforcers? And that's what you tacked it a little bit in your answer. Are we providing all the reinforcers? Is the reinforcement immediate, salient, and sufficiently comprehensive? So let's talk about the last one. Well, we may, you know, we gave most of them, but we couldn't do X, Y, and Z. And I always ask people, are you sure we can't do X, Y, and Z? Are you sure we can't get that learner the hell out of there? You know what I mean? Like, why are we doing it with that learner in there anyway? You don't have a cafeteria? Let's go to the cafeteria and do this. That person doesn't, that kid doesn't need to be part of the EO because if I can't, if they can't be part of the reinforcement, I can't have them be part of the EO. Do you see what I'm saying? They go hand in hand. If I'm going to control one, I got to influence control the other. So I'm going to probably re-engineer that a little bit. And then the last thing I want to talk about is sometimes we think we can't provide the reinforcer, but even if we did, it wouldn't work anyway because it's not the reinforcer. I'll go, I'll riff off what Matt said. A lot of kids say, I want my mommy. I want the bus at 10 a.m. Now, there are a handful of kids that their that manned is accurate, but for most kids, that's a generalized manned. That's, I don't like it. I want something. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? The mommy could show up and that child will still be crying. But the kid who says, I want my mommy. 
Do you see what they just want? Some kids are just not right. They're not feeling good, whether it's meds or not, you know, they just don't have any effective repertoire for that environment. And so our job again is to see if they, make sure that that thing is a manned. A lot of times those mans are not precise and they're more generalized and uh, we can get away by just enriching that environment. And um, so anyways, a long answer to a short question. I hope some of those things may help you. Not an easy question. So it certainly merits some conversation for sure. Uh, I've got another question. This is from uh, Sarah from California. Um, I had a question about telehealth. Uh, your views about, she's curious about your views about conducting AVA sessions via telehealth, uh, as well as recommendations on how to make effective for clients. I know you and I talked about that. I think it was around this time last year, as a matter of fact, in response yeah. to the, uh, the, the, the shutdowns that were happening, uh, more, you know, uh, so you, you guys pivoted to telehealth, uh, uh, pretty hard. Uh, so what, what have you learned since then about it? I just want to go back real quick to Kelsey uh, asked a question about progressing the EO slow. It just, when I, we say progress the EO slow, we mean if the real hot spot, the classic example is, you know, removing the iPad from their death grip. That's the, where the hot spot is that you probably should do six things before that, <laughs> you know, maybe stand up, uh, mm-hmm. give us a, a sound that you're going to be coming over, say a word, clap your hands, get close give an instruction uh, maybe to put the iPad up on the table, then maybe do a little visual occlusion if they didn't respond to that. So you're doing like five or six things signaling the impending doom. That's what progressing the EO is all about, to give the child an opportunity to respond before they're emotional. You can imagine if you just kind of rushed in and grabbed it, what can they do but hit you? What can they do but scratch you? What can they do but slap themselves? So give them a chance by putting in a bunch of S deltas, signals of impending doom before then they can respond effectively to those signals. And now you've got a learner that's lucid and you can, you know, move to communication and whatnot. Okay. But back to that question, Matt, um, could could you just remind me? Yeah. Yeah. More generally, what have you guys learned about telehealth since being, having to, having to switch to that? And, you know, we we talked about this uh, a little bit uh, a year ago, but obviously there's a lot more, I would imagine you've learned since then. Well, I'll tell you one thing I learned, Matt, if you make a company and your lawyer says, you can't use that name, that's too general. You got to come up with a new name in six hours. Cause that's when it says you go to live or whatever. And I'm like, oh, okay. So my daughter and I go in our basement, we come up with an acronym, it's FTF. And it's this five reasons for FTF. Thank goodness, because one of them was face to face. So it was a little bit of egg on my face when our face to face mission in our company was <laughs> obliterated by COVID. So I'm like four to five, you know, was operating, but we're not doing any face-to-face. I haven't been on a plane in ages, for better or worse. So telehealth is very real for us. People say, what do you think about it? I don't really have any thoughts on it other than it is the what it is. You know, it's just acceptance of, of what is. And uh, we just problem solve and make it happen. Uh, there's some advantages to it, uh, which I'll try to articulate. But the main thing is this. Uh, if we have to deliver ABA via telehealth, we do it. Uh, do we prefer it? No, of course we want a live human next to another human. The therapeutic alliance and all that good stuff is better under those conditions. But I'll tell you one advantage. One advantage is when parents are doing some of the work and they're enjoying it and their child is learning in it and you don't have to do a lot of generalization. And uh, instead of a parent taking some, oh, God, I'm gonna say something so negative. Oh, edit, self-edit. That was a self-edit. Instead of parents taking a principal's ABA course from your company and they learn all about reinforcement and punishment and stimulus control and Skinner and Watson, how about you just help them solve a problem via telehealth? I think that's a better way for them to learn principles is when they are actually applying it to a problem that matters to them. And so I like that about telehealth. I'm seeing more parents do implementation and all that. But that said, let's just riff off that for a minute. If you are having parents implement uh, and you as a professional are on the other end of the line, a couple things to consider. Uh, number one is uh, I always make sure there's two types of meetings. There's one meeting where it's just the professional and the parent, no child. And I know there's a lot of issues, single parent families and all that, but there's usually someone who can be with the child at some point. And that's when you want to schedule those meetings. You need the implementers undivided attention to make sure you have knowledge covered and you can do some role plays and Q and A's and all that stuff. And then the second type of meeting is obviously the live implementation meeting where they're purposely with the child and you're either not saying anything or you're doing coaching through bug in the air. 
Uh, in other words, sometimes you can do uh, live observations and not interact because the parent needs to focus and any distraction sometimes is a trouble for the child. So if you have that other meeting, then that other meeting becomes reflection, planning for the next direct observation. So there's this go back and forth between those two meetings. And sometimes uh, that's absent. And, and for us, we learned the hard way that both of those meetings were terribly important to telehealth, have good stimulus control over the implement, implementing or discussing. Um I don't know what else to say about it. I think the other thing is just to make sure that you have a scope and sequence to whatever you're doing. Uh, telehealth is hard when you're just kind of chatting. <laughs> you have to have yeah. a mission. What's the objective? Do you have a process? Is it sequential? And make sure the parent's comfortable progressing to each step. So we're a little maybe over systematic sometimes, but whether we're doing sleep or feeding, whatever, we have steps to the process and we don't go to the next step till we've mastered the early step. And, And uh, it's about child performance and parent comfort. Those are the criteria. It's not about parent integrity, by the way. Isn't that a funny one? When we're doing support via telehealth, parent integrity, the score is not actually what's guiding our decisions of advancement. What's guiding it is how independent the child is at that step and how comfortable. And then what's the parent's comfort level? Do you want to go to the next step? You good with this? Again, it's not, what's 80%? What's 90%? They're completely arbitrary numbers that are generally meaningless and totally affected by how you draft the code. So those code, those decisions on integrity, I'm not so sure about. Ask the parent where they want to move on and and the proof's in the pudding. How's the kid doing? They're doing well. Let's go. All right. All right. Very cool. Uh, It's a cool question from uh, Natalie from Long Island. Uh, I've utilized, uh, hi, Dr. Hanley. I've utilized your My Way program with great success. Uh, right. Most recently this year with a student with whom I practice the skills one-to-one in my office. He has yeah. now generalized the skills and scripted language into the classroom and increased his tolerance for delayed access to preferred items or activities greatly. Uh, That's the part I think is really cool. Interestingly, his peers have been imitating him and have learned to use this skill as well. Isn't that cool? Uh, my right. question my question to you is uh, regarding... Um, the specific language script for the student. Um, if you have a verbal student who's high functioning, would you provide him or her with more socially appropriate language instead of my way, such as may I have that now? So can you talk a little bit about, you know, how, how that uh, FCT might evolve over time with the learner who is uh, really digging it and obviously it's, it's working for them. Yeah. That's, that's the right way to uh, put it, Matt, too. And I, I'm really glad uh, that you're having this kind of success and these are thoughtful questions. Uh, the thing is, I, I would like my way for kids who are vocal, verbal, and have other, you know, a lot of mans in their repertoire. I would eventually love it to go away. So please know that. I want it to go away. I, it would love, be lovely if it's specific. But I'll, I'll tell you this. In the beginning, it's terribly important to me because what I've learned is I don't care how good the kid's language is. Sometimes in the heat of the moment, they can't find the words. They don't know what they want and they don't know how, or they either don't know what they want or they don't know how to articulate what they want. Even kids with great language, even me, even you. Do you dig what I'm saying? Do you always have the words when you're about to be disappointed by somebody? No, no. You have it like the next, that night when you're like, oh, I should have said. Oh man, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Oh, I do. <laughs> same, the same thing with kids with autism. They don't always have the words. So here's the beauty of my way or any omnibus man. If they say my way and you say, sure, you can have your way. (sighs) Take a breath, my man. you got all day to figure out the words because I am here for you. That's what we're signaling when we say it's okay, it's your way. So an omnibus man is for all children to me. The data is really clear on it. Mashid has a lovely study, Mashid Kayamagami, showing this language able boy at great language. You did not have any intellectual disability, but when we're trying to teach specific mans in the moment, problem behavior is persisting until all the mans for all the reinforcers are learned. And then even under those conditions, there's still like word find issues, if you want to call it that. Omnibus man just takes the heat out of the situation. I know it's a little weird. I know it's grading. I know that in some cultures, native, you know, indigenous people, they don't want kids saying my way. I get it. Say boogaloo, come up with new words. It's all good, but just treat it as a gateway man that when they say those words, the gateway to the kingdom of everything awesome is open. And just say what you want after that. And if you do that, you're going to have a safe passage 
through some of those cab chains. And then for some learners, it just drops out. You know, you put the O and they say, oh, you know, are you sure I can't play video games a little bit more? And hey, why don't you go hop and get me some popcorn too? Sure, that's great, right? Once trust has been built and the flame of, you know, problem behavior is uh, is off, then then we can do that. All right, cool. I, I put a call for questions out into the chat. So if you want to, I know people have been patient. Uh, let me ask a question while people are typing theirs and maybe this will, uh, maybe this will resonate with some folks. So there's one kid I'm working with uh, and uh, I, he, he, uh, uh, very, very, uh, very verbal kid. Um, he was able basically to learn all the steps through just, you know, kind of perhaps just rule presentation essentially. Um, and, and he, uh, uh, I, I thought what I was progressing the EO. So I said, okay, hand me the iPad, go to the table and get started on your, you know, in your workbook. And he gets up and does it. <laughs> so, uh, and of course, you know, that was this, you know, and it's, it's, it's part of me is like, wait a second, you're supposed to say my choice, please, or my way. And I'm supposed to say no. And you're supposed to say that's cool. Uh, but instead you just get up and do. So what do you, what, what, what's the conceptualization at that p- point? You know, like, I mean, I, it's not like I interrupted him and made him and prompted him through that, that process or anything. I was very pleased that he, that, you know, a kid who has difficulty with cooperation was went ahead and and did it. But uh, it, 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 it took me up by surprise. And, and uh, so, uh, you know, given the, given the topic of reflection, you know, I'm trying to think through, okay, this happens again. What are we going to do about it? Right. Well, listen, we got to recognize that Ted Carr and those before him, taught us that just enriching an environment and following a child's lead and essentially getting HRE before we attempt to teach has therapeutic value and sometimes has an impact on problem behavior, meaning it minimizes it. Now, to me, it's not a therapeutic uh, process strong enough to live on its own. It's not its own independent variable because it's fragile. It's not enough. Any antecedent thing like that is only going to be so uh, useful in the long run. But we do see that when we're hanging out with all the reinforcement and following their lead, that sometimes we say, okay, man, man, why don't you stop that and go do this? They're like, you bet, sir, anything for you. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because that, that's called a relationship. You know what I mean? You gave a little, now they're going to give a little. So, you know, there's other ways that we can conceptualize it behaviorally, but that's no fun. So uh, <laughs> that's how you say it that way. But so it's not surprising to me. However, in the therapeutic process, when problem behavior is still a risk, there's a lot of risk factors for problem behavior resurging for that learner. Our general rule of thumb, Matt, is if they don't engage in the sequence of the core skills and they just go and cooperate, that we will celebrate that. We will not prompt those behaviors. We'll simply say, yeah, lovely doing your work. That was amazing. Let's go back to your way. Now if we go do it again and they're skipping those behaviors again, we probably would prompt them. Now, it depends how language able they are. Now, if they're super language able during reinforcement, we might intrude a little bit. You know, at the shades of gray part, it's not black and white anymore. We might intrude a little bit and say, hey, you know, when I ask you to do your work, if you don't want to do it, you know, you can just communicate. Even mm. if you even if you want to do your work, sometimes you might just want to practice that so you don't forget those skills. You know okay. what I mean? Remember, we call it practice for a reason. It is practicing for the big games of life, big game of life. We know this is constructed. We know there's a little bit of reactivity to it. That's why we give it that name practice. It's not the big game. It's not the real game for a lot of learners in therapy. It's it's emulation. And so it's okay to call it with that. You got a language able child. You want to tell them exactly what you're doing. We're practicing. Sometimes you just want to practice that. But I would also say, but I thought it was amazing. You just went to the table and banged out all that algebra. Like, Amazing. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? So it's just having that conversation with those language able kids and, and really it's about being honest. I think that's the other thing, Matt, that's a little outside the edge of your question, but these kind of real language able kids, especially if they have trust issues and whatnot, they're in special ed for no reason other than they, you know, grow up in a language impoverished environment and whatnot. We got to spend a little bit more time in reinforcement to build their trust. So we don't get that counter control. And then we have to be reflective on the process with them. And again, a lot of kids don't want to talk about this stuff. That's what Ditu tells me and his colleagues don't try it a lot of time. There isn't a lot of conversation, but I still think it's important you give the opportunity because every now and then they'll drop a gem on you. And uh, okay. <laughs> Are you looking for a new job, but you're overwhelmed with all the emails that you're getting from various ABA agencies? What if there was someone who was in your corner and could help you find the perfect job placement? Well, that person exists. 
Barbara Voss has been working as a recruiter for over 30 years, and her company, HRIC, specializes in placing BCBAs in permanent full-time positions throughout the United States. Barbara has been placing BCBAs since 2011, so she knows our business, and she offers personalized service to any BCBA looking for a new position. She also helps companies looking to hire BCBAs, too. Here are just some of the things Barbara can help you with. She can provide information about salary ranges in different markets across the country. She can help you write your resume. She can coordinate and prepare you for the interview process and even help negotiate the right salary for you. And best of all, there are no charges to any candidate for all of these services. When you are ready to make a change and want to work with someone who will listen to you and understand what you need in a new position, contact Barbara at HRIC. To schedule a confidential discussion, head over to hricolorado.com. Again, that's hricolorado.com and hit the contact button to connect with Barbara. You won't be disappointed. All right. So we've got a lot of questions in here uh, that are starting to fly in fast and furiously. So um, I did like a maybe a, do the the uh, the the, uh, the FTF lightning round here. Maybe we can. Okay, uh, I'll give uh, short answers. Well, I'll, you know, you give as long. You can give answers of any length you want, but uh, I'm longer uh, than haiku. I'm oh, right that, that 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 would be impressive. Go. All right, all right, folks, uh, get your uh, count your syllables here. Um, all right, uh, as someone who is relatively new to the field, what are these changes to consent slash assent that you are seeing in the field that are positive? Hmm. A little resident to call them changes because there's been a lot of people for 50 plus years in their practice have been amazing, making sure their clients were providing proper assent. Uh, but it's not general. And I think maybe the changes are, it might be coming a little bit more general. But uh, what I mean, uh, I guess, practically speaking, is we no longer close doors for kids in therapy. How's that? Mm-hmm. Just don't close the door. If they want to leave, they don't have to ask permission. That's an example of not letting them withdraw assent. Like if they can only withdraw assent through a particular process, do you know what I mean? Like you can withdraw assent. You have to write a short essay, get it notarized, send it to the chief behavior analyst. They'll review it. And in two weeks, they'll tell you whether that assent can be withdrawn. I'm being silly, but you understand my point? You mm-hmm. can't expect a particular form of assent. You have to have a wide class of behaviors that basically are their assent withdrawal, such as leaving the room. Now, it sounds silly. I'm just going to go off this for a little bit. It sounds a little silly, but when we first started doing this, it was so eye-opening. The client would leave the room, big guy in a residential facility. we got the rich environment set up. Everything seems to be going swimmingly, and they leave the room. Do you know how nervous everybody is? Now, that's a form of withdrawing assent. We're like, let them leave. The best part was I I can still see to my head where they went. They would go to the restroom. And wash their hands, like do it without any task analysis, prompt support. We just let them leave and they'd go use the potty and come back. It was great. Sometimes they would go to the snack cabinet. They wouldn't raid it, take everyone. They would take a bag of Doritos and a napkin and go back to the, (laughs) they're like, well, if you're going to let me go places, let me try this. And the limits they would test were never very limiting. And so when we would allow people to withdraw scent, they usually do it ever so briefly. And they usually coming back. With a, into a more reinforcing environment, either negative reinforcement because they have an empty bladder or positive reinforcement because they have cool ranch Doritos. But my point is that when we provide the opportunity for them to withdraw scent in multiple ways, there's two things really going on functionally. One is there's not a sense of being trapped. And so you don't need to engage in mammalian severe behavior to get out of that. You see what I mean? like SIB, aggression, destruction, right? That's what mammals do when they're trapped, when they're cornered. I'm not saying that's where this behavior all comes from. That's too simple. Sometimes it's just purely instrumental. It's nothing to do with any emotional state, you know, to feeling trapped, obviously. But the point is when you allow for that open door, you let kids leave, you generally don't get a lot of severe behavior because you don't have that angst for lack of a better term. Second, You have like a free operant preference assessment where they go, where they going? How could they want to leave our therapy? We have like everything they love in here. We're trying to be so accommodating and listening and following and nice, yet they want to leave? Shocking. Where the hell are they going and what are they doing? I got to know. 
So it's like a free operant little preference assessment. Be careful of stalking. Uh, the uh, the thing we're doing now that some of our cons- consultees have taught us, they've come up with this. And that's why I love what we do is our process gets refined, not just by the client, but the people we're supposedly supporting. They're teaching us. So one good example is uh, kids, not only when they leave, they're allowed to leave, but that's not actually withdrawing a cent from a lot of kids. They've taught them that there's this space, this beanbag corner, and that's where you go. And we promise we won't do any EOs. You know what I mean? We're done for the day kind of thing, unless you opt back in. And so also just another tactic is making a clear location that you're not going to put in um, establishing operations. And by the way, it's not a terrible idea to provide them reinforcement there. Okay. Let me put it a different way. Tricking kids into liking therapy within a concurrent operant arrangement, I think also should be in our rear view. Do you know what I'm saying? Oh no, you can opt out, but you know, I'm really fun in session and your better iPad is in session and your movies are in session, your Doritos in session, but you can go hang out on that mildewy beanbag chair alone. Of course you can withdraw a cent. Do you see what I'm saying? Yes. The quality of reinforcement can be the same. We know that kids prefer to yearn and earn for the reinforcers. And that's what gives us the freedom to allow a cent withdrawal into a reinforcing context where kids won't need to escalate. So I went off a little bit from the question, but I hope yeah. some of it. It's uh, more of a sonnet, I think, than a than a haiku, perhaps. Oh my God! I was supposed to do a haiku. <laughs> Did I say that? <laughs> that was even more than a sonnet, Matt. That was yeah. like a, a Ted Hughes rip on nature. You my, know? <laughs> my 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 English literature uh, uh, teacher wife would uh, you know we'd have to get her to figure out yeah. how to categorize that. I really um, set myself up with that IQ comment. That's never going to happen. Anyways. All right. What, what, uh, let's see what else we got here. Uh, I have an adult learner engaging in SIB to the point of habitual. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what that means, but uh, it occurs in all environments. Uh, the learner has visual impairments and I have no therapist for her. How do I go about the PFA and SBT? Family is willing to do and learn whatever works. Uh, yeah, it's probably a lot, a lot of... Yeah, this is one of those which, you know, I'm not trying to, you know, sell things here, but I'd say, hey, reach out, do a thing called a quick consult at FTF because you're going to need some help. Listen, the more challenging the case, the less likely I can give you any meaningful answer in a Q&A like this, to, to be yeah. honest. Uh, yeah. you, need, you need support. So I'll, here's what I want to do for that question answer, though. Here's what I suggest. You have like three of your toughest clients, right? They're they're killing you. You know what I mean? They're just killing you. They're making you like a day drinker on Thursday. I get it. We all have that. Okay. Don't, don't put all your profession, you know, as you're expanding your scope of competence as a professional, those aren't the kids to really do it with, to be honest. The kids to do it with the ones you do have resources. There are less obstacles. You do have a therapist do it with some resources first and learn the technology and then extend it to those more and more challenging situations. I know that's counterintuitive and I, and I know you're hurting and you want, you know, you want that solution now, but, um, and, and again, what I would suggest for that client is get a collaborator, get a collaborator who's done this process effectively so they can help you. You bring the, the obstacles and together you overcome them. But I, I can't give you anything specific for that uh, situation, especially because I'm supposed to be in haiku mode. That's right. That's right. Uh, and so if people want that quick consult, they can go to ftfbc.com and there's uh, places to find that there, I believe. We could put that in the show notes too for others who might be considering that. Um, let's see. Uh, what are what are you seeing people use for uh, uh, picture exchange cards for my way or for the omnibus man more generally? Uh, none. Next question, Matt. Look at that. Wow. Okay. No, I'm just kidding. I would never do that. So rude to the question asker. Here's the deal. Uh, I love PEX. All that stuff is great, but we generally don't use PEX for the omnibus man. I, I really would strongly recommend you use vocal or gestural for the omnibus man. Once it's reinforced, the PEX book appears and they can sentence strip away or hand a card or whatever level they're at. You see what I'm saying? So we don't use PEX usually for the omnibus man because I don't want it to be a restricted operant and affected by where the book is or where the proloco to go is set up right on the iPad, etc. Out of your mouth, 
with your hands, or if worse, I don't have one in front of me. If worse come to worse, a big red Big Mac. Hit the Big Mac. It's on your side. It's on your tray, on your wheelchair. And then the listener comes over, says, of course, you can have your way and presents the PEC book, presents the augmentative communication. So we never run away from the language system a learner has in general. But for the omnibus man, I, I, uh, the language system that exists is not the main determinant of the topography of the uh, omnibus man. The, the main determinant is efficiency of that response. Um and just for people who are listening to this as a podcast, the uh, the gestural response is a thumb pointed towards the yourself, <laughs> essentially, right? That's the uh, that's the topography that you uh, you you guys have uh, used. Okay, um, very good. Um, all right, let's see. Um, here's a fun question from Belinda: Where do you get all this energy? <laughs> I absolutely love your passion, and I love your willingness to bridge disabilities uh, into emotionally disturbed arenas. So. That's so nice. Let me take a compliment and just kill it. I'm on crack most of the time. Most of the time. I mean, sometimes I got to take a break because that stuff will kill you. But uh, that's just, listen, uh, and I get feedback too. You can't make jokes about that. You can't make jokes about, I don't know, homeless and drugs and all this. Well, I do. I do all the time because I make jokes about the things that scare me and things that are hard. And, you know, my brother's a counselor for homeless folks and a lot of my friends are addicts, and, you know what I mean? So I make jokes about these things. But no, I am not on crack. Drugs like that scare me. Uh, I don't know. I, I have as much energy as you. Uh, I work. I get up for these things. Uh, and I'm as tired and dragging ass as anybody else at times. And uh, But I do have, I do have an energy uh, for this field because I, I've been in it long enough. And I really – I just – I'm in a place right now where I care a lot and I'm around a great team of people and we talk about just doing good and it, it really jazzes you up. So I, I think it's because I have a great job and a great team of people around me. And I, I do drugs, actually. I do caffeine a lot. Um, what else? I don't know what else, but I thank you for that lovely compliment. And I'm sorry I killed it with sarcasm or whatever that was. I was tempted to make a Worcester joke, but uh, I... I uh... I withheld so um, there's so many there's so many it's a great place though yes it is it is uh but let's see uh, oh here's a oh here's a question jenna thank you for this question in advance any advice for measuring and moving towards fluency and skills-based treatment jenna i'm here to tell you you're asking the wrong guy uh <laughs> well matt thinks i'm against fluency which is not no true. no 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 just the measurement of it <laughs> yeah, I will admit that early, early in my career, I was managing group homes at the Groton Center. I was obligated to use uh, acceleration charts uh, at some meetings. Then I would go back to my office and graph them normally for everybody else. And so <laughs> I learned early on. But I also, you know, I studied with Hank Pennypacker and I, I see the value of it and all that stuff. But I in fluency too, I, I think, yep, we should do things accurately and with pace. But I'm more about accuracy that sometimes with pace again, I love the example of Don Bear was, you know, it took him a while before he would respond. Uh, but when he responded, it was gold every single time. I'm not sure anyone would describe that performance as fluent by any uh, measurement tactic uh, <laughs> we have. So I don't even know where the question was. What, well, what's the question, Matt? It's a, what am I supposed uh, to be doing? Um, let's see, percent correct measures accuracy, oh. but any recommendations for measuring speed when responding is contingent on the EOs in the environment. Rate wouldn't be accurate as it depends on how many EOs occurred. And, uh, and I, the reason I love this question is these are these are things that I'm talking about with some of the folks that I'm practicing with because uh, we you know, like just me personally, I know I'm not a I don't consider myself a precision teacher, but I I have a deep appreciation for yeah. uh, for the practice of it, and I know enough to be dangerous. And I, uh, if, if there's a way to, uh, you know, increase skill acquisition through, you know, using, uh, you know, dimensional units of behavior, you know, graphed on a chart, that would be, that, that would be cool. In other words, I would love to get you and like Rick Cabina in a room together and, and like in a whiteboard, you know, yeah. I think that would be cool, but that's, yeah, I think that's be just cool me. Too. I, I listen, I've had people send me, uh, ISCAs like regraft on acceleration charts and, you know. I, I think the conversation needs to be had. I, 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 I no doubt about that. But I will tell you this, where we agree that the question I ask her is, we don't graph anymore in terms of session aggregates. We graph on time series graphs, which is a step closer to the acceleration chart. I, I'm not 
too worried about acceleration per se because of the type of responding we're looking at. I care a lot about time though. I care a lot about latency. I care about latency to respond from the EO, latency to get back to HRE once reinforcements provided, et cetera. So I care about, uh, and I, I don't even care as much about rate. I know rate's the basic datum. I know like a, like a t-shirt. No, latency is fine. But, yeah, latency. But, but I do care a lot about the latency and I just care about the overall picture. And that's why we graph these things on these time series graphs right now. And, and you know, what's really important to me it, uh, beyond like rate or percent correct and all this is, are we doing multiple measures? I need to know about dangerous behavior and mild behavior. I need to know about HRE. I need to know about engagement. I need to know about negative emotional responding. That's the kind of stuff we just had like severe behavior on a graph, but that you'll never know the story. I need to know those other elements to really understand. So I'm more focused on making sure we have all the responses that paint the right picture of clinical progress in place and less concerned about whether it's on a green and white chart or a black and white chart or, you know. And I just say to each his own, when I consult and people throw it on their own charts, I say, yeah, that, that's cool. You know, just as long as you got all those measures we need to know about, I, I need to know. Well, I don't know. How do you know if he's HRE? I don't know. I can't tell in this graph because you have one line. That's what I would, you know, what, how I respond to those things. All right. The, uh, the, the, the PT SPT integration uh, uh, will, <laughs> will, will be uh, a, 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 perhaps a, something for down the road. So yeah, that's a, um, all right. I, I uh, let's see. Uh, I know I'm holding you over uh, your time here, Greg. Um, let me see Worries. if we can squeeze another question here, if it's all right with you. Um, where Someone has a question by the opinion on change of the task list, and I must complete I complete ignorance. I know nothing about that stuff other than when it gets emailed to me. Uh, but I love the citizens and great volunteers that work on that stuff. But I got to be really clear. I haven't done BCBA supervision in probably a decade. I do clinical supervision and I don't do be taskless supervision. I, I just, I, I did it for a long time, but I didn't find it. Uh, I, I found I had a hard time with it. I didn't want to go over a preference assessment because it was the day to go over a preference assessment. I went over a preference assessment when the kid needed a preference assessment. You, you see the difference. So I'm really ignorant of those changes of foot. So sorry, someone else, Celia would probably, Megan Miller, they know that stuff. Back of the hand maybe, I don't know, but I'm ignorant of that. I see. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Here we go here. Uh, <laughs> Updating the fast. Yeah, I know. I know. Uh, a lot of these are getting like really into the weeds of a particular client issue. So I want to avoid putting you on the spot like the some of the previous questions here. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Um, oh, here's a cool one. Uh, who of you or uh, who do you look up to uh, professionally currently these days? Oh, God. I that was from uh, Raffaella. On that question. Isn't that good? That's a good one. Is That's a good, a good question. one. I, I look up to, I've always looked up to Alan Kasdan. I say it all the time. I mean, this guy, you don't know who he is. Figure out, uh, find him. He, he writes, uh, he's done a lot of early good behavior analysis writings. He does a lot of cl clinical writings. He writes for popular press magazines like Slate. He's out of Yale. He's a clinical psychologist and he's really bright and funny as hell. And so, uh, Alan Kasdan, Pat Fryman's always been a hero and a colleague of mine and kind of like a, a, a non-mentor mentor. You know, I didn't study with him per se, but I rely on him and his, his uh, how he models professionalism. And uh, so he's always someone I've looked up to. And then there's, there's people past, uh, people don't know, uh, Ted Carr is a hero of mine, always has been, always will be. And the more my career develops and the more I go back and read Ted Carr's work, I, I realize I'm just dusting off his ideas. Uh, so Ted Carr is a uh, real important person uh, to me. And uh, I guess that's what I'm learning is I've had so many mentors. I, I don't have time to list them. People got to go eat dinner and whatnot. I've been very lucky in that regard. But what I'm finding is I read more and more. There's so many more mentors out there that are teaching me stuff, even like Israel Gold Diamond. I've had, I've had a nickel for how many people say, hey, is your is what you do coming out of the constructionist approach? I might not be even saying that right. Is that part of Israel Gold Diamond's work? I'm like, eh, I don't think so, but I don't know. I, I wasn't trained in that school and I haven't read it uh, much. And then when I finally sat down and read his 80 page diatribe, what constructivist approach was, I'm like, yes, that's it. That's exactly right. So there's a lot of convergence. And when I see convergence, I learn a little bit more about the things we're doing and we, we make it a little bit better. And so I'm getting new 
new heroes that aren't even with us anymore. But thank God their legacy lives on because they published. And so I'll leave it at that. But yeah. there's obviously more, but those people are really important to me. All right, cool, cool. I think I think that's a great place to leave this uh, at, Greg. Um, and again, I've held you about 10 minutes over your time, so I want to be respectful of that. And people need to go uh, live their lives and get HRE on their own. Um, so, uh, I just want to thank you again. Um, someone wrote in, is this the fifth time Greg's been on the podcast? I don't know. I've actually lost count. Um, so I don't know. Uh, yeah, it's gotta be the fifth at least. So, uh, anyway, it's always, it's always great uh, chatting with you. Um, also again, um, if you missed it earlier, huge shout outs to Celia Heyman and the ABA study group for doing all the good work they're doing there. Uh, getting all those people across the finish line of the of the board examination. Amazing. It's just amazing work. And of course, uh, Megan Miller, all the cool stuff she's doing um, and for letting us use her uh, uh, super high-end Zoom account. Thank you, Megan. The Hetty Topper will go out in tomorrow. Tomorrow's, uh, well, I, I won't specify how it's going to get there because I think that might be, uh, you know, perhaps uh, that might be against the law to, to put certain things in the mail. But uh, anyway, um, all right. I think that's going to do it. So, uh, Greg, uh, thank you very much. It's been a Thanks, lot man. of fun. Great Everyone else, we've had like over 300 people on the, on this call. That's awesome. Uh, all awesome questions. Say, Matt, it's cool the way you bring people together. You've been doing it for a while, but you just did it again. And then I get to see all these people that I know. And, and some of them I know so much. I love them at this point. And it's just cool. The community you, you create, you're a connector. Meg Miller, Celia, you guys are connectors. Dr. Jay's on this call. Uh, you just connectors and I, and to me that's the cool stuff going on right now it, the connections being made and there's some leaders uh, in this group so i appreciate that thanks thank you thank you all thanks. right you guys have a good night all right thank you greg see you thank you for listening to the behavioral observations podcast with matt sicoria you can find matt's notes on this episode at www.behavioralobservations.com We also invite you to stay connected with us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash behavioral observations and on Twitter at behavior podcast.